Uh, this video, incidentally, is launching today on your YouTube channel, right? It actually launched about 10 minutes ago. All right, good. So go to Little Wars TV YouTube channel. You'll get to see how the Battle of Gettysburg might have changed based on your orders. 12,000 votes. What are you holding there? Well, I didn't want uh, Wayne to be the only one bringing cool artifacts uh, to the show here today. So this is a Model 1861 Springfield rifled musket. And when you're talking the tactical level in the American Civil War, rifled muskets are basically inescapable. This is the game changer. And I love that Wayne brought up the manuals because the manuals were undergoing constant evolution at this point. And the one that really a lot of people were reading was Hardy's 1855 manual, which is basically a complete ripoff from the French. <laughs> and this manual is being written to incorporate new ideas and new tactics because of the rifled musket. You know, we get on Civil War commanders a lot. They were in the rear, they were drunk, they weren't as good as we are, but I don't think I ever hear people rip on Hardy. Well done, man. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Hardy, he's made it through pretty evenly so far. Good, good. So, Greg, this is perfect for you, man. You know, cause, because we talk about tactics all the time and we love to Monday morning quarterback this stuff, right? We all like to do it, we can't help it. You know, we do it at Gettysburg, we do it everywhere we go, but you actually war game this stuff. Uh, tell us about war gaming a little bit and, and how, what has that taught you about Civil War tactics? Well, it was a pleasure matching wits against you at our battle, Gary. Viewers can see who came out on the upper end of that. But I think that the most fascinating part about historical war gaming in particular is the appreciation that it gives you for the burden of command that these men had at the upper levels. It's so easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, but when you play in a game like that, you come to realize that battles develop a momentum all their own. It becomes a snowball effect, and you find yourself painted into a corner very quickly, where decisions that you made early on basically become inescapable, and it's very hard to extricate yourself from that momentum. That's really cool. Now, before we, uh, you know, let Wayne go real quick, do you have a favorite? I know you're a Gettysburg guy, but, you know, operationally, strategically, is there a campaign you really like that the Civil War people might not know about? Oh, well, one of my one of my favorite campaigns, I you know, I think is the Vicksburg campaign, Gary, because it's, you know, that really sets forth the tone for the next couple years of the war. It's such a significant campaign, and working here at Gettysburg, I think we always go back and forth, which one of these two are going to be more significant? And certainly when it comes to control out in the West, no one can deny uh, the fact that Vicksburg is an important place uh, for the Union forces, and the victory there at Vicksburg for Union forces is really going to set the tone for the next couple years of the war. All right, cool. Yeah, stay here for a second, both you guys. Uh, you're with the American Battlefield Trust on Facebook. I'm not sure if we're on YouTube, are we? Um, on YouTube Live, thanks so much for joining us on YouTube as well. We're trying to work on all of our glitches. Please share this with your friends or tell your friends um, about our particular brand of what we do, our freak show, coming out here with guests and artifacts and talking about weird stuff as we talk not just about Gettysburg here at 156, but also about a much broader subject. I'd like to bring on Craig Swain now, if he will, um, while Wayne's still out here, because first of all, he's holding something of Wayne's, um, and then we're going to talk about some other things as well. So, Craig, what in the world is that thing? This is a 12-pound Whitworth bolt. 2.75, so two and three quarters inches. What makes this interesting or makes this unique, you notice it's got flat sides to it. It's designed to go, and we have a couple examples here on, on, on the field at Gettysburg, designed to be fired from a Whitworth rifled cannon. Uh, it had what we called hexagonal rifling, so that unlike most of the projectiles that you will find, rifle projectiles you will find in the Civil War, this does not have a lead sabo or, or um, soft metal expansion pocket at the back. It is designed to be fired without that. So it's kind of a unique for the Civil War. It's almost an evolutionary dead end, but these are imported from England by the Confederacy and the Federals. The Federals have two batteries imported of these Whitworth rifles and use them on the Peninsula campaign yeah. and later at Petersburg. Okay. We, haven't, we haven't had audio for a minute now. Okay, I mean, for a full minute. Are we still on YouTube, though? <laughs> hey, that was great okay, stuff. I, I can see that, that we're actually stuff. on YouTube. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, well, we're trying to, it serves us right, trying to do Facebook and YouTube at the same time. Let's talk for a second here, and then we'll come back to Facebook as we can. Yeah. So, um, you said a few things there real quick. First of all, it's pronounced Sabo and not Sabbath? Depends on where you're from. Okay, <laughs> and, then, and then, that's great. And thanks, Craig. And then, um, this is Craig Swain, by the way. Uh, to the Sound of the Guns is the name of his blog. Now, all you guys, do you know what sound a Whitworth gun bolt supposedly made going through the air? I, I, I don't know. It's a whistling. Isn't a it? shrinkish, like a whistling? hellish sound. Yeah, yeah. shrieking wicka wicka. Now, I bear think, in mind, like this, is, this is 12 pound. This is relatively small. One of the downfalls of this on the field as field artillery, the payload is not that great. Yeah. Not a lot of explosive content. Whitworth also made up to five inch and I believe up to seven inch Whitworth rifles using the same basic process. 
using this hexagonal bore for uh, uh, rifling. There was a 70 pounder, that's five inches in, in terms of the bore, 70 pounder that was captured by the Navy, captured on a blockade runner. And the Navy turns around and reuses that against the Confederates on Morris Island bombarding Fort Sumter. And they immediately found there's another problem with this, that laying it here in my hand, I can begin to feel it, you probably can out there. This thing's off, off uh, is uh, lopsided. When it gets into the air, the reason it makes this shriekish hellish sound is because it begins to tumble. Wow. Somehow that's even more terrifying. Yes. <laughs> wow. Imagine a 70 pound version of this flying at you at Fort Sumter. Well, and you can see these things flying through the air sometimes, which I've seen at the North South Skirmish Association. Yes. You can see artillery coming through the air, which is just unbelievable. Now, let me just ask real quick, because I could stand up and whisper it to Chris, but are we going back on Facebook too as well? Okay, we think we're going back on Facebook, but we're still here on YouTube. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. You're on our YouTube channel. Welcome to everybody who are watching right either now or later. I'm with Wayne Moths from the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Greg Wagman, Wagman Little Wars TV, and Craig Swain to the sound of the guns. Now, Craig, while I got you here, I mean, you said so many things there. Uh, for a lot of people watching, what in the world is a Whitworth gun? Okay, again, <laughs> way back. Way back, way back. <laughs> An English design or English inventor in England, in, in just before the Civil War, determines that in the better way or possible better way of rifling is to use a hexagonal bore and not, as most of the uh, the inventors who were experimenting with rifling at the time, they wanted to have a lead or or, or soft iron cup at the back, so that when the when the cannon is fired, that soft metal is pushed into the rifle. What Whitworth said was that's that's just extra weight. That's extra. Uh, in encumbrance of the on um, the gun. Instead, he said, "We'll make a hexagonal bore, have it have the projectile machine so it fits exactly into that bore, and that will impart the rifling as it goes out. And so it's a little bit more efficient in terms of friction, such like that. But as you say, there's some there's some difficulties with the implementation of that when you get to the field. Now, Gary, this is and Craig can correct me wrong. This is the stealth bomber of the Civil War." People, when they come and visit the, the battlefield, they don't understand the range of this artillery. So could you tell everyone what a standard cannon, maybe you've already done that, versus what a Whitworth will fire range-wise? St thank you. The standard uh, rifled gun, you're going to get maybe, uh, if you're based on a field carriage. Now, this is the, 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 the nuance of it. On a field carriage, it's restricted in its elevation. You're only going to get maybe a couple miles of range out of it. You're more so restricted on what you can see versus how far this gun can shoot. The Parrot rifles that they used at, on Morris Island were firing up to ranges of 8 miles. This particular piece, the Whitworth, could fire, fire up to 12 miles. But again, what were, they, could, they had to see what they're hitting at. It's not like today's artillery where they're going to get on the radio and say, forward observer, tell me where this lands. Back in the Civil War, if they fire it off in the distance, it's probably not. they don't know what they hit, so they need to know. They need to be able to see that target. I'd be very surprised if any of the listeners or viewers knew that Civil War artillery, unless you're a real expert on this, fired that kind of range. To me, that's yeah. tremendous. Yeah, and again, the, and this was at, at, at the Siege of Charleston. At, you know, you ever, the context here, the battle, the movie Glory, after Glory, after the Federals have taken for, uh, Battery Wagner, they set up siege lines on Morris Island and begin to fire into Charleston begin to fire into Fort Sumter, and they're routinely, every day, firing Parrot rifles at ranges of up to eight miles. Wow, good. So I want to talk about artillery more before we kick Greg off as well, too, but um, just real quick, you're with the American Battlefield Trust, and um, we're, we're going a little high level here, so I want to get back into this Whitworth thing real quick. This is a gun that shoots a bolt. That's one of them right there. It can shoot farther than most of them, and also, unlike other guns, it is not loaded from the front. It is actually loaded from the back at the breech, which is just incredible. Correct. Mo there, Whitworth made two different varieties of this in the same caliber, both breech loading and muzzle loading. Cool. The muzzle loader was the more popular one because it was easier to make. But the breech loader, the actually, just as we say, it, it, as it implies, you swing out a, the block at the end of the breech and you shove this in, you shove a powder charge in behind that, and you close the breech. At the time of the war, that was the most sophisticated method of loading and firing artillery. The downside of that, it's got a lot of moving parts. It's not until really closer into the 20th century, better materials, better machining, and a lot better techniques that we that we develop true field artillery that's able to not only uh, fire breech loading, but the other problem with even that he didn't solve was the recoil. Every time he fired it, they still had to recite the gun. 
So other advances had to come along before we get World War One style artillery. And let's think about that artillery, by the way. You get rid of, um, you figure out how to load it from the breach, get rid of those horses, put tracks on, and you have a tank, which isn't that far from what we're using today. So as archaic as Civil War artillery still seems, and we're not that far away now. Welcome back to Facebook, people. I'm told that we might be back now. And by the way, I think I seem to remember it was not even 30 minutes ago that I was like, oh, we don't need to be in the shade. I'm sure the equipment will be just fine. <laughs> So, sorry, I'll take blame for that one. Well, I want to pick on a, co a comment that you made there, Gary, about the archaic nature today for us of Civil War artillery. The fascinating part about this is that at the time, in the 1860s, European military observers are flooding into the United States to see this artillery, which is not at all archaic at the time. This, yeah. is, this is a testing ground where the Europeans are having a great time watching us test these new advances in weaponry like the Whitworth. Good. So uh, so what we see here is a great case where we talk about this uh, strategic, operational, and tactical level. There's two things that constant play here. One, there's the unchanging nature of war. This is this clash of wills, human beings involved, leadership, and all the other things. What you have right in front of you... Hurry up! <laughs> muskets or rifled cannon it's a part of it this is a logistics the armies now are able to fight year round they're able to fight campaigns after campaign after campaign when they fight out here at Gettysburg Meade re-equips the Army of the Potomac some of that ammunition is being brought up by train as far as it can go and then brought by by uh, by wagon and they're able to get the Army of the Potomac back into the field much, much faster than a Napoleonic army was So what you to. see with these yeah. technological changes is this is the changing character of warfare. And this is when we get into the point of going, hey, the tactics aren't keeping up with this new weaponry. And therefore, we see always this tug and pull between what has been successful in the past and what is changing because of these introduction of new pieces of technology, whether it's behind us or at the tactical level for the individual soldier. Great. Okay, so thank you, Doug. Doug's popping in and out. That's awesome. So just before we kick some of you guys off, I keep threatening to, but we've yeah. almost gone through all of our guests now, so that's not so bad. But Greg, so you already talked about a little bit about the intersection between war gaming with Little Wars TV and the actual reality. What about artillery? How, how, what have you learned about artillery in war gaming uh, as opposed to when you used to work here at Gettysburg as sort of a, uh, you know, as, an, as a seasonal? Uh, what have you learned? Well, I'm sure lots of people are going to want to comment on this, but in war gaming, there is a tendency because of the nature of a war game. You see a hill and you assume maybe little round top. Well, I can go put 20 pieces of artillery up on that hill. After all, it's just a tabletop. Well, when you come out here to the battlefield, when you look at some of these hills, when you go to little round top, imagine dragging that Wentworth artillery piece up through the rocks and just how many of them could you get up there? There's a huge difference between playing a game and coming out here and seeing it for the real thing. And let me just say real quick, well, I've, in the sun. I've studied that one. You <laughs> talked about Hazlitt's Battery a lot at Gettysburg, and these guys who witnessed Pickett's charge, they saw the grand spectacle. They saw seven of their friends die and several wounded, a lot for an artillery unit at Gettysburg. But they didn't write about that so much. They wrote, wow, it was really hard to drag those guns up to Little Round Top on July 2nd. That's what they remember. Indeed, just, just getting an army to the battlefield, in many cases, it is the difference between <laughs> winning and losing a battle. All right, cool. Guys, out of here. Phil Spoggy, <laughs> um, North-South Skirmish Association. Get while. back on out here. And then, hey, thank you very much. I wore my Iron Brigade pin just for Phil. I got this from the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable when I spoke there, and I've, I've been wearing it on and off ever and since. You remember so. the Iron Brigade Association? Let's talk about Gainesville. Yeah, but first, oh. first what I want to talk about is never touch me. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, secondly, yeah, so we got the Iron Brigade. We've got all these famous units, right? You know, you've got the Orphan Brigade, Iron Brigade, Stonewall Brigade, and the Stonewall Brigade actually fights the Iron Brigade at Bronner's Farm. So what is the Iron Brigade, first of all? Well, the Iron Brigade is the all-Western Brigade of the Army of Potomac. And uh, at Gainesville, which is Bronner's Farm, the name Bronner's Farm comes from Alan Nolan in his, uh, in his regimental history, or his history of the unit. Actually, the veterans called it Gainesville, was their actual first combat. And it was a slugfest. It was two hours, nose to nose, 80 yards apart against the Iron Brigade and Stonewall Jackson's, uh, actually would have, been, would have been his corps at the time. Uh, Jackson did not, at the time, uh, commit all his troops. Uh, Gibbon, as he rode at the head of the Iron Brigade at the beginning of the battle, 
noticed what he thought was Confederate cavalry on the ridge to the, uh, to the north. As they turned, he saw it was a Confederate artillery battery. He ordered up Battery B, which was his old pre-war battery, got the Iron Brigade in position, and for two hours they stood there and fought each other. It's unique to, to notice the Iron Brigade took 40% casualties in that battle alone, their first battle. Uh, the Stonewall uh, Brigade took as much casualties, including uh, the, one of the Georgia units had 76% casualties, 21st Georgia, I think, 76% casualties, which was only second to the first Texas through the whole war uh, for Confederate units. Well, well, that's a lot of things there. So you, you mentioned the Stonewall Brigade and the Iron Brigade. First of all, yep. they're not even the Iron Brigade yet. They're which not is the interesting. It's their yet. first real fight, you know. They're not even the Iron Brigade yet. And then they're fighting the Stonewall Brigade, who had fought a year earlier as 4,000 soldiers. Now they're like 900 yeah. or something like that. So, I mean, these, these casualty figures, these are the same soldiers fighting at, you know, Antietam and, and Gettysburg and 2nd Manassas and, 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 and Chancellorsville and, and Gettysburg. And it's you're, crazy. And you're right, because within three weeks, these guys had gone through, uh, they went through Gainesville and then South Mountain and then Antietam. And you know, uh, and they were rookie soldiers, not at the end. And by the time they got through with Antietam, their their ranks had been uh, reduced to uh, more than 50 percent. So okay, well then, and then they come to Gettysburg, where they're going to suffer a lot. And I'll invite any Gettysburg person to come back on here to talk about this. So uh, you've got 20 seconds. Iron Brigade at Gettysburg, hit it. Iron Brigade at Gettysburg. They came on the field. They pushed Archer across the stream. Took a little law. Held the left flank of the uh, of the Federal Army and fell back to the barricade and saved the saved the Union. Wow, good! Check it out. That's well done. Anyone else want to give that a try? I see Doug maybe thinking about it. Um, you know, so the Iron Brigade. They, uh, let me let me try it then. Go. They come on the field. They cross Willoughby's Run. Push the Confederates back. Fall back themselves. Fall back to the Seminary. Hold for a while. Fall back to. Culp's Hill, no one attacks there, famous unit. Save the Union. Oh, save the Union, exactly. sorry. You've I've said that, that I've said that before and I get in trouble. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll protect you. Nice, okay. And nice pin, by the way. Hey, thank you very hey, much. Excellent, bud. Um, you know, one other thing about Gainesville is that is where Dick Jewell will lose his leg. And you can make the point that maybe that affected his performance at Gettysburg. You could say here, what did he famously say when he was shot here at Gettysburg in that leg? Oh, he, he, they got his wooden leg. I don't know exactly what he, he said. It doesn't hurt a bit to be hurt. shot in a wooden leg. leg exactly. you know. Okay, whoever wants to come out here, I want to talk a little bit about soldiers and how much smarter that we are than them. So, Doug, come on out. Anyone else who wants to join, you can stand or not, but we can't help it. This is our thing. We think today that somehow if we were to be in the Civil War, we wouldn't have marched right up to somebody else and done this. Are, are, are people right to think people are stupid, guys? So I would say absolutely not. One, we have to assume these are human beings. They're as smart as you and I. They're as brave as you and I. They want to be as successful as you and I. And the will to live was as great in the 1860s as it is today. So when we say that these guys haven't adapted to having these new pieces of technology in their hand, that's just not true. If we look back at the Napoleonic era, you'd see Napoleon would roll up his artillery, fire a bunch of grape, a canister, and heavy cavalry would charge through the center of the lines. Now that they have rifled musket, what happens? Artillery is a mile to a mile and a half away. We no longer have heavy cavalry. But here's the thing. If ever you want to mash your fires, because you can't, while you have increased range, you can't load and fire it any faster than you could those old, uh, those old muskets from the Revolution, well, guess what? Your shoulders still have to be shoulder to shoulder and too deep. Moreover, command and control will demand it to try and keep control of these formations on the battlefield. And finally, what we should never lose sight of today. We still have soldiers to take fighting positions with two people in them because of that touch of the elbow means all the difference for soldiers that are engaged in heavy combat. Cool. Craig? Again, we, and as Doug is touching upon the technology and how they have to adapt to it, keep in mind these commanders are evolving tactics on the fly. No one prior to the Civil War knew how to conduct a mounted cavalry charge with repeating rifles. That's something that was invented in the Civil War. And that's something that the veterans are going to carry forward their experience and begin to use that to twist and spin what the next generation of tactics will be. No one has, um, you know, in, in context with the Civil War, no one has really begun to think through it with the artillery what is the effect of the, uh, the introduction of the Borman fuses, some of the other mechanical fuses, because this allows the artillerist to perfect where they place their charges on the battlefield. So as Doug is talking about standing back two miles away or a mile away from the infantry, now the artiller is in the, the Napoleonic era, they kind of shunned away from that because they couldn't predict where that fuse would explode and where those, the, the, it would scatter. 
by the time of the Civil War, the Borman fuses and other fuses that had come along, the artillerists have gotten really good at that. And they can say, ah, you want me to hit a target 600 yards away, 800 yards away? I can do that, boss. And I can do that consistently. And that's going to change the, how the infantry approach the battle. That's really interesting because, you know, you've got people at the Battle of Bull Run, the largest battle in American history up to that time by far, 4,500 casualties, maybe 56,000 soldiers on the field. There was no one on that field that had commanded more than 500 men in battle before. So that's really interesting on that front. Um, you're watching the American Battlefield Trust Facebook and YouTube channels. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you're sharing this stuff with your friends. Make sure you download our new app or update our Gettysburg Battle app where we have all sorts of cool things going on and our new updated Gettysburg app. You'll really enjoy it. It's got some new features that I think you'll like. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, you go to Little Wars TV too. We're launching our Little Wars uh, game uh, that we played in Lee's headquarters not a half mile away from here where you all voted on who would be the winner it's on little wars tv on youtube right now now before i bring it over to chris Mikowski, i want to say that you know as a battlefield guide you get the our soldiers stupid question a lot really with great frequency and i often turn it back on them oh yeah what would you have done and a lot of them especially if you're like a 40 or 50 something dad oh i'm glad you asked because they all have the answer i i, I have a thousand guys i'm not going to send them all in at once i'm going to send 200 over there I'm going to send 300 over here, then I'm going to send 500 here, and then I'm going to take another force and form them up there. All your enemy does is shoot the first 200, reload, shoot the next 300, reload, shoot the next 500 again. You, sh you send 1,000 at once, you know, um, at least you're going to have seven or 800 left to continue the fight, okay? These soldiers had these ideas, like this idea of, oh, I'm going to move around their flank. Oh, thank you, says Robert E. Lee. I didn't think about that. I mean, they're always trying to outflank people. Again, like Doug said, they have the same thoughts as us, the same cares as us, and they were limited by operations and technology. So keep that in mind as you formulate your own theories, Chris. And I think the human element is really important because there's something to be said about the fact that these regiments are all recruited from the same hometowns, and you're going into battle with guys that you have grown up with, that you've known your whole life. You don't want anyone going home saying you're a coward. And, and you also want to be able to be able to let your buddy know that you've got his back. And so that, that human connection that, that precedes the war by years is a powerful motivating force for keeping these guys together on the battlefield as well. Doug, you've had that experience personally. Well, so it's an interesting thing. You talk about this idea of what we've talked about, how we integrate technology, but back to our original point about this idea. In the past, it used to be at this tactical level, you know, when Henry V leads his men at Agincourt, the tactical level was the strategic level. When the king and his army won the battle, they won the war. We are now at this, almost this, you know, first modern war where you could be successful looking back, and you could argue that many generals are there, or we have all this changing technology that's leaning towards the future. And what develops is this operational level. It was brought up about Grant during the Vicksburg campaign. You can no longer annihilate an army in a single battle, but rather you have to stitch those battles together in time, space, and purpose to get to your strategic end. Whether it's Vicksburg or the Overland campaign the as it translates campaign, to, yeah. to, to Petersburg. That is novel, that is new. It's a whole new level of warfare that we see develop. And we've been talking about uh, how these tactics have to adapt to technology, but something we haven't talked about is how these tactics have to uh, adapt to terrain. And we are on a perfect spot on the battlefield to illustrate that point. Um, and, and Craig, I know that you're, you're, you're a big terrain guy, so hop in here. But uh, you know, when, when the Federals are deploying on basically a north-south axis here, discover that they've got a threat to their right flank, well, the tactics say that we're going to refuse the flank. Well, look what happens when they refuse the flank, which means you've got a 90 degree bend to help protect your flank. Well, that flank is going to extend across this big, flat, open plain. The tactics are sound. The terrain is absolutely awful for something like that. And of course, the Union 12th or 11th Corps pays the price for that. They're following the tactics they're supposed to. The terrain is not going to be cooperative. Yeah, this is cool. So, and so let's get down really granular before we kind of end it and tie this thing up and talking about the biggest thing. So, to what level? And anybody jump in here, but because I don't think our viewers know. Like, you know, I think some of our viewers have, you know, watched the Gettysburg movie and they're like, oh, I know about, uh, you know, the 20th Maine, or they've listened to Phil and said, oh, that's the brigade level. I'm pretty good. Well, there are like 600 regiments at this battle alone, and there are fans like I think the 45th New York is fighting on that plane. There are fans of Company B 
45th New York. I mean, there are some real granular stuff you can get into where you're like, oh, I just love the right two companies of the 17th Maine. I mean, that's my thing, you know. <laughs> but but in the biggest sense, when this battle, when this war started, Winfield Scott had the grand idea, right? He had one strategic aim on how to defeat the South. And it wasn't through battles, and it wasn't through strategy and grand campaigns. It was through a plan to blockade southern ports. What was that called? The Anaconda Plan. Anaconda Plan, yeah. you know. So, so what's going on with this? Who wants to take the Anaconda Plan? Here comes Doug. I'll take, oh, go ahead, oh, please. Go, no, go. Uh, well, in a nutshell, what, what's, what Scott had seized upon is to defeat your enemy at this, at, at this stage of a man's evolution, you don't just go out and beat his army. Again, it's, this is not Asian Corps where you're, okay, I beat the army, I won the war. You have to defeat that nation in detail. You have to bring them to a point where they cannot, they don't no longer have the capacity to wage war. And what Scott is looking, taking from what he learned in the, in the Mexican War, is he realized, well, if he blockades the southern ports, he prevents them from, from ha exchanging goods with Europe. He cuts off their source of revenue. They can no longer buy new cannons, new muskets, or, or in this case, the, the Phil will tell us the uh, uh, old muskets that they were pawning off on the southerners. But he begins to cut them off from the rest of the world. Furthermore, slicing through the south and taking away the arteries, uh, the, tr the navigation arteries, the Mississippi River, we mentioned Vicksburg, why that was so important, not only just splitting the Confederacy, but reducing its ability to interconnect internally and be able to trade back and forth or move troops back and forth between the theaters. And, and it's, it's really, again, a takeoff of what he learned from the Mexican War and how where, where we had evolved as, as human beings to these larger, you know, requiring this level of warfare in order to defeat a, 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 an opponent. Not bad. So it becomes really interesting, though. So now go back to our idea. Strategy is supposed to be this balance of ends, ways, and means. So he's picked an end, but he has chosen a way, blockade and driving down the Mississippi. But he lacks the means. Just to drive down the Mississippi would take 60,000 soldiers. Remember, the United States Army is only 16,000 strong. Moreover, how do you blockade a coastline over 3,000 miles long with a Navy that has barely 60 ships? And by one ship that can enter Charleston Harbor. <laughs> so, so by the time we're all done, even as he writes up this strategy, he says the problem we will run into is the patience of our loyal and patriotic Union friends. The political environment domestically will not let Lincoln build up a million-man army and the largest Navy in the world by 1865 to execute that strategy. Circle this back around. Gettysburg, the importance here. Just a few miles, or, or what, it's about 50 miles up the road, 20 miles, how many miles up the road is Harrisburg? Help me out here. 40, 40 that 40, way. 40 that way, excuse me, 40 <laughs> that way. I'm all mixed up, 40 that way. Susquehanna River, the coal that is powering the Navy ships in the blockade is coming down the Susquehanna River. If the Confederates control the Susquehanna River or cut it off for just a single week, that disrupts the entire blockade, cuts them out. This is why a lot of this, going back again to strategy, the, the tactics feeding in the strategy, these little things begin to factor in. What can you, you know, your, your leash begins to, or your reach begin to exceed your grasp here in many cases. Good, I, I wanna, look, Chris, you go, then I'll bring in uh, Greg to close it up. And I think it's really important to, to see how strategy builds upon strategy because the Anaconda Plan is so successful. When Grant takes over as commander of the Union armies in 64, he has a major strategic shift when he says that it is going to be the destruction of enemy armies that becomes the objective. It's not capture the capital. It's going to be where Lee goes, you shall go too. And then moving all pieces across the board, tie down Confederate forces and wear them down. If he can't get that knockout blow, he is just by no other means than attrition going to wear them away. That's a huge strategic shift that's only possible because those earlier strategic aims are accomplished. Yeah, and that's really interesting you say that, because even this Anaconda plan is going to affect Civil War photography, which we'll talk about in one of our li lives tomorrow as well. It's really, how would the Anaconda plan affect Civil War photography? Tune in tomorrow, we'll talk about that. But um, I don't know of a better way to, to close up on this, Greg, than, you know, you can read all about Civil War strategy, grand strategy. There's a good book called On Grand Strategy you might want to read as well. Um, but, you know, even when you start getting into that, you can visit these places, but it's hard to put together. You know what the best place to do grand Civil War strategy is? Is right on the game board. So what have you, have you done the anaconda plan before have you ever done anything like that well the anaconda plan is is more of a board game level yeah. and there are certainly lots of great civil war board games out there that you can play what we like to do in our group is is more at the tactical level miniature on a tabletop like the one that represents gettysburg and as great as those games are and as much as you can genuinely learn from that experience i still think that there's really no replacement for coming here and seeing it for yourself. Absolutely, and now that, you know, since I set you up for a bad close, um, let me uh, ask you, uh, um, God, oh no, it's happening.
happening right now. I'm in my 50s and these things happen to me all the time now. So you said you had some good quotes about Europe. You already broke out one of them, but you have any of those for that we can close on in terms of tactics or strategy? Absolutely. Good, I want to read you one of my favorite quotations about strategy. This is a question of how Civil War generals commanded, because very practically it's difficult to know. You know, what was, what was Lee doing for three days during the Battle of Gettysburg? And luckily, there was a man sitting right next to him who appears in the movie Gettysburg. This is a British Colonel Fremantle. And I'd like to read you the two-sentence description he offered of what Lee was doing for the duration of the battle. This is Fremantle. He says, Generally, Lee sat quite alone on the stump of a tree. What I remarked especially was that during the whole time the firing continued, he sent one message and received one report. It is evidently his system to arrange the plan thoroughly with his three corps commanders and leave them the duty of modifying it and carrying it out to the best of their abilities. And I think that two sentence description is probably the best I've heard at how little control a Civil War general actually had over Once the battle. Once this thing gets underway. It's the momentum that I talked about earlier. Once the momentum begins, even the greatest of generals have a difficult time reining it back in. Yes, and let me say, hashtag generally, General Lee was sitting on a stump. That's pretty cool. You don't hear that too often. Uh, whoever was on, pop back on real quick so I can thank you properly. For you all who are watching, um, to Greg at Little Wars TV, to Doug, Licensed Battlefield Guide, and more, to Wayne Motz, our good friend from the National Civil War Museum, one of my oldest Civil War pals, to Greg, uh, Chris Mikowski, Emerging Civil War, Phil Spogging, North-South Skirmish Association, and Craig Swain, to the sound of the guns. Thanks, guys, for joining us so much. Thank you for watching, and thank you all for supporting what? Battlefield Preservation. Thank you all.